Let's journey back in time and revisit the turbulent period of 1945-1949, when China was torn apart by ideological conflict in a struggle that would shape its destiny. The nation was in the grip of a fierce battle between two powerful forces, the nationalists, led by Chiang Kai-shek, and the communists, led by the visionary Mao Zedong. This was the Chinese Civil War, a gripping struggle for dominance that would reshape the destiny of a vast and ancient land. After the dust settled from World War II, a new conflict unfolded on China's home front. It was a clash of ideas, political dreams, and military strength. The nationalists aimed for a united and modern China, while the communists envisioned a nation rooted in Marxist principles. So brace yourself as we explore the heart of the conflict, its reasons, strategies, and the unwavering spirit of those caught in the middle. Join us on a journey through a pivotal moment in Chinese history, where the fight for control became crucial for the birth of a new China the beginning of China's struggle. As the curtains fell on World War II, China's struggle for unity took center stage. Fast forward to the aftermath of World War II, and the once united front against Japan in China began to crumble. Throughout the Second Sino-Japanese War, which lasted from 1937 till 45, the nation found itself divided into three distinct territories, Nationalist China governed by the established government, Communist China, and regions under Japanese occupation. Despite their common enemy, each region was locked in a complex dynamic, with Chinese military forces ostensibly united under the banner of the United Front. The Potsdam Declaration's acceptance by Japan on August 14, 1945, signaled the end of a prolonged era of suffering for China. Decades of Japanese occupation and eight years of brutal warfare had left scars on the nation. Millions had perished in the heat of battle, while countless others succumbed to the harsh realities of starvation and disease. Contrary to the expectation of tranquility, with the conclusion of World War II, conflict persisted within China's borders. The end of global warfare did not bring an immediate end to the internal struggles that had defined China's recent history. The legacy of pain, sacrifice, and resilience endured, casting a shadow over the uncertain path that lay ahead for a nation grappling with the aftermath of war. With Japan's defeat, a frenzied race ensued between the nationalists and communists for control over crucial resources and population centers in northern China and Manchuria. Nationalist forces, leveraging the transportation support of the US military, swiftly seized key cities and the majority of railway lines in east and north China. Meanwhile, communist troops secured significant territories in the northern hinterlands and Manchuria. The once fragile United Front a temporary alliance between the nationalists and communists now unraveled. Both factions had tacitly agreed to collaborate only until Japan's defeat, understanding that internal pursuits would have to wait until the national struggle was resolved. The nationalists' waning effectiveness and growing corruption, particularly evident to the North Chinese who viewed them as a distant government in exile in Chongqing, created a power vacuum. By 1945, the communists found themselves riding a rising tide, their influence gaining momentum as the nationalists faltered on the war-torn stage. Semblance of hope. The post-war landscape hinted at the possibility of averting a renewed civil war, fostering a semblance of hope for a negotiated settlement between the nationalists and the communists. Even as the ink dried on Japan's surrender, nationalist leader Chiang Kai-shek extended a series of invitations to his communist counterpart, Mao Zedong, urging discussions on reuniting and rebuilding the war-torn nation. In a significant movie, Mao, accompanied by American ambassador Patrick Hurley, arrived in Chongqing on August 28, 
1945. By October 10, 1945, both parties announced a tentative agreement to collaborate towards a united and democratic China. However, the path to reconciliation was fraught with challenges. Committees were slated to convene, addressing lingering military and political issues left unresolved by the initial agreement. Yet, before these committees could meet, serious conflict erupted between government and communist troops, shattering the fragile truce and plunging China back into the throes of civil strife. The Marshall Mission In response to the eruption of violence, U.S. President Harry S. Truman took swift action, dispatching George C. Marshall to China in December 1945. The Marshall Mission achieved a crucial breakthrough, coaxing both the government and communist factions back to the negotiating table. On January 10, 1946, an armistice was reached, temporarily quelling the hostilities. By January 31st, the Political Consultative Conference, a diverse body representing various factions in Chinese politics, reached a series of pivotal agreements. These included the reorganization of the government for broader representation, the convening of a National Assembly on May 5, 1946, to adopt a constitution, principles for political, economic, and social reform, and the unification of military command. George C. Marshall, in late February, successfully mediated an agreement on military force integration and reduction. The plan outlined a Chinese army of 108 divisions, including 90 government and 18 communist, under the overall command of a National Ministry of Defense. However, before these agreements could be enacted, fresh conflicts erupted in Manchuria. The withdrawal of Soviet occupation troops in March-April 1946 triggered a scramble for control. Nationalist forces occupied Mukden, Shenyang, on March 12th, while the communists strengthened their grip on northern Manchuria. Although a 15-day truce was declared in Manchuria from June 6 to June 22, after government troops took Changchun on May 23, fighting escalated elsewhere. Government and communist forces clashed in Jehol, Chengde, northern Kiangsu, Jiangsu, northeastern Hopei, Hebei, and southeastern Shantung, Shandong. The road to peace in China remained elusive, with the nation still gripped by the throes of internal conflict. Attempts of reconciliation. In a bid to foster reconciliation, George C. Marshall and newly appointed U.S. Ambassador John Leighton Stewart attempted to broker talks between the warring factions in late August. Their goal was to explore the possibility of a coalition government. Unfortunately, this endeavor proved futile, as neither the nationalists nor the communists were willing to relinquish their hard-fought military gains. As tensions escalated, nationalist forces besieged Kalgan, a strategic communist stronghold, in late September 1946. In response to this threat, lead communist negotiator Zhou Enlai withdrew from peace talks. Kalgan ultimately fell to the nationalists on October 11 prompting Zhou's return to the restored nationalist capital at Nanking, Nanjing, on October 24, for further negotiations, to pave the way for broader participation in the new National Assembly, Chiang Kai-shek issued a qualified ceasefire order on November 11. The Assembly's opening, originally scheduled for November 12, was postponed to November 15. Zhou Enlai, attempting to rekindle negotiations, flew from Nanking to the communist stronghold at Yan'an on November 20th. On December 4th, Zhou communicated with Marshall, proposing a fresh start to negotiations if the Kuomintang would dissolve the ongoing, deemed illegal, National Assembly session and revert troop positions to those of January 13, 1946. Amidst these negotiations, the National Assembly proceeded without the Communists or the left wing of the Centrist Democratic League on December 25, 1946, adopting a new constitution. 
blending elements of presidential and parliamentary systems with Sun Yat-sen's five-power constitutional democracy, it was slated to take effect on December 25, 1947. Until the new constitution was implemented and a new president elected, the nationalists would continue to govern as the ruling party. The subtle diplomacy continued as both sides navigated the complex terrain of power dynamics and conflicting interests. End of the mission. In January of 1947, after completing his mission in China, Marshall didn't hold back in his criticism of the extremists in both the nationalist and communist factions. His departure, just a day after delivering a scathing condemnation, marked a turning point. Following Marshall's departure, Peng Suepei, the government's minister of information, made a significant announcement. The nationalists expressed their willingness to resume peace negotiations with the communists. Taking charge of this delicate task was General Zhang Zhijong, who embarked on a journey to Yan'an with the aim of reigniting talks. The proposal for negotiations reached the communists through Ambassador Stewart, but the response mirrored earlier stalemates. The communists stood firm on their demands insisting on a return to the military positions of January 13, 1946, and the nullification of the new constitution, terms that had previously been rejected by the government. The diplomatic dance continued, highlighting the complexities of the situation and the challenges in finding common ground. By March, tensions escalated further. The government ordered all communist personnel to vacate its territory, and on March 15, Chiang Kai-shek accused the communists of armed rebellion, solidifying the rift between the factions. The capture of Yan'an on March 19 brought joy to the nationalists, yet communist spokesmen remained confident in their ultimate triumph. In their ultimate tri Amidst this turmoil, Maoist strategy focused on securing a base among the rural peasantry, prioritizing the countryside over urban strongholds. By year end, government forces saw minimal gains, with the capture of Wei Highway and Chefu disrupting the communist sea route to southern Manchurian ports. Conversely, communist forces made strides in central China, closing defensive gates at Nanking in September. In Manchuria, communists diminished government control to Changchun and Mukden, establishing an isolated pocket in Kirin and asserting dominance over the rail line into China proper. In a December 1947 report, Mao optimistically observed a turning point in history, signaling the resilience of the Chinese People's Revolutionary War. Continuation of War China's internal strife was intricately linked with diplomatic relations with the United States and the Soviet Union. Despite over a year of concerted efforts to mediate between the national government and communists, the United States, facing unpopularity in China, withdrew as a mediator. Seeking to avoid further entanglement in China's affairs, the US government notified the Soviet Union of a reduction of its forces in China to 6,180 men by June 1, 1947. However, the worsening economic and military situation in China, coupled with the spread of communism in East Asia, prompted the appointment of a US fact-finding mission led by Lute, Genjur Albert C. Wedmeyer. He arrived in Nanking on July 22, Wedmeyer's mission received a warm welcome from the Chinese government, but faced criticism from the communists, who deemed it imperialistic. By the end of August, Wedemeyer left and urged the Chinese communists to halt the voluntary use of force and emphasize the need for immediate political and economic reforms by the central government to regain public confidence. This statement, however, did not sit well with the Chinese government as a consequence, Premier Chang Chun declared on September 2nd that there would be no alteration in China's domestic or foreign policy based on Wedemeyer's mission. 
Despite the sensitive nature of Wedemeyer's full report, which warned of an imminent communist victory, unless the US substantially increased support for the nationalist government, the US Department of State withheld its publication for two years. By November 11, Secretary of State Marshall submitted a program to Congress calling for $300 million in new aid for China. By the end of 1946, things escalated quickly and were growing serious. As 1947 drew to a close, official figures reported nationalist military strength at around 5 million men, with roughly half deemed combat ready. The US military estimated communist troop strength at 1.1 million, but the communists clearly held the momentum. By early 1948, the nationalists found themselves in a deteriorating military position, having lost the initiative on all major fronts and gradually losing their edge in numbers, equipment and training. Shifting to a defensive stance, the government aimed to stabilize the situation in Manchuria, holding isolated areas through airborne resupply, maintaining control in key northern cities, and preventing communist expansion in northwestern, central, and eastern China. In 1948, the communists, led by the strategic prowess of General Lin Biao, executed a relentless offensive against the nationalists, targeting weak points along their lines and disrupting crucial overland supply routes to Manchurian posts and major centers in North China. The year unfolded as a series of calculated moves that systematically expelled the nationalist army from Manchuria and North China, with communist victories often hastened by defections among government forces. In Manchuria, key cities fell like dominoes. Kirin on March 12th, Qin Xi'an on October 15th, Changchun on October 20th, and Mukden on October 30th. The capture of Mukden and the surrender of its sizable garrison virtually concluded operations in Manchuria. In North China, communists seized Luoyang, Luoyang on April 7 and Yan'an on April 22, the former capital. By the year's end, major urban centers in the north, including Xinan, Jinan, Chengzhou, Zhengzhou, and Kalgan, were firmly under communist control. Seaports in Shantung except Tsingtao, Qingdao, also succumbed to the relentless communist advance. Communist-held territory burgeoned from one-tenth of China in early 1946 to one-third by late 1948, covering a vast expanse of over one million square miles and hosting more than 200 million inhabitants. With complete control of Manchuria, roughly half of Inner Mongolia, and substantial portions of various provinces, the communists set their sights on the Yangtze River, the nationalists' last line of defense against impending attacks on Nanking, Nanjing, and Shanghai. Amidst this territorial shift, the communists made a bold proclamation on September 1, 1948, establishing the North China People's Government, a precursor to their envisioned People's Republic, encompassing the entirety of China. The relentless communist offensive not only severed the nationalists from vital resources, but also paralyzed communication and commerce in the war zones. Financial crises deepened in government-held areas, exacerbated by galloping inflation and soaring living costs that eroded public morale. The nationalist government, grappling with economic challenges, resorted to printing more money leading to the destruction of the yuan's purchasing power. From 9 trillion yuan in circulation in late 1946, the number surged to a staggering 700 trillion by August 1948. This economic collapse devastated savings for professionals and middle-class workers in the nationalist heartland, triggering widespread strikes, student demonstrations, and labor unrest. The surge in black market activities added to the chaos. In a desperate attempt to stabilize the economy, the government introduced rigid price and wage controls, imposing harsh penalties for economic crimes. While a new currency, 
the gold yuan was introduced, close ties to the nationalist government shielded many from prosecution for violating the new laws. As morale of people went down and inflation persisted, Chiang showed a willingness to negotiate a peace settlement. In a symbolic move, the communists published a list of 25 war criminals at the end of 1948, prominently featuring Chiang's name, an ominous sign of the shifting tides in the struggle for China's destiny. End of the war and creation of National Republic of China. In 1949, the protracted struggle for China between the nationalists and communists was nearing its climax. The year commenced with a nationalist plea to the Big Four, the United States, the United Kingdom, France and the Soviet Union, to mediate a settlement with the communists. The United States, a long-time supporter of the nationalist cause, swiftly responded stating that such efforts would not serve any useful purpose. On January 14th, Mao expressed his willingness to negotiate on specific terms, including the punishment of war criminals, abrogation of the 1946 constitution, abolition of the existing form of government, reorganization of nationalist armies, confiscation of bureaucratic capital from nationalist party elites, and land reform. Other conditions included the abrogation of treasonous treaties and the establishment of a democratic coalition government excluding reactionary nationalist elements. Simultaneously, the communist advance persisted, leading to the fall of Tientsin, Tianjin, on January 15, 1949. In response to mounting pressure, Chiang announced his resignation as President of China on January 21, passing nationalist leadership to General Li Tsung-jen, Li Zongren. On January 22, Li accepted Mao's eight conditions as a basis for peace negotiations, prompting nationalist forces to commence their withdrawal from Peking, Beijing. The fall of Peking set the stage for the communist advance on the nationalist capital of Nanking. After a preliminary peace delegation from Nanking, Mao agreed on February 9th to hold an official peace conference within a month. Li flew to the new nationalist capital, Canton, on February 20th, seeking support for peace efforts. General Chang Chi Chung headed the nationalist peace delegation, while Zhou Enlai led the communist mission. Talks were set for April 1st in Peking, allowing time for communist forces to regroup along the Yangtze and near Nanking. From April 6 to April 12, delegates discussed three key communist demands informally. These included allowing communist armies to cross the Yangtze, establishing an interim government with Mao as chairman, and punishing certain families. Formal negotiations began on April 13, expanding Mao's peace program to 24 items within three days. The crossing of the Yangtze and the elimination of the national government emerged as critical issues. On April 17th, the communists issued a three-day ultimatum for the nationalists to respond. Li's government rejected Mao's peace draft on April 19th, triggering an immediate all-out offensive by the communists. Nanking fell on April 24th, signaling the beginning of the nationalist government's collapse. In rapid succession, the communists captured Hankou on May 17th, Tsingtao on May 25th, and Shanghai on June 2nd. To consolidate nationalist forces, a Supreme Council was formed in Canton, with Chiang Kai-shek as chairman, Li Tsung-jen as deputy, and Yen Hesishan as premier. In July, the communists launched offensives into South China and the Northwest. Changsha fell on August 5th, followed by Fukao on August 17th and Lanchao on August 28th. The nationalist cause on the mainland reached an inevitable conclusion. Inevitable co From his capital in Peking, Mao made a resounding declaration on October 1st, 1949, officially establishing the People's Republic of China. The swift recognition of this new government by the Soviet Union and the communist bloc set the tone 
prompting several other countries to follow suit by the year's end. On October 10th, the nationalist government formally informed foreign diplomats of its decision to once again relocate the capital, this time to Chongqing. The communists pressed on with their advance, seizing Canton on October 15 and Amoy on October 17. As the communist forces penetrated the southwest, the nationalists, acknowledging the changing tides, relinquished territory culminating in the abandonment of Kueyang, approximately 200 miles south of Chongqing, on November 13. The map of power in China was undergoing a seismic shift, and the inexorable march of the People's Republic of China had become an undeniable reality. Aftermath of the war. As the nationalist struggle reached its dramatic climax, a series of significant events unfolded. On November 20th, Li embarked on a flight to Hong Kong, and by December 5, he sought medical treatment in the United States. Responding to the shifting landscape, the nationalists designated Cheng Tu as the seat of a drastically reduced national government on November 24. The fall of Chongqing on November 30 marked a turning point, leading to the relocation of the national capital to Taipei, Formosa, Taiwan, on December 8. The communists continued their relentless advance, seizing Nanning in far southern China on December 6. One of the last remaining nationalist armies, led by General Pai Chung Hussey, disintegrated, fleeing to Hainan and French Indochina. By December 10, when Chiang left the mainland for Formosa, the mass exodus of people, goods, and institutions was largely complete. The strategic relocation had begun earlier, with the Nationalist Air Force transferring assets to the island as early as August 1948. The Navy and the government's gold reserves followed suit. In early December 1949, the last bastions of nationalist control crumbled as generals and provincial governors in Xinjiang, Yunnan and Sikang switched allegiance to the communists. By the year's end, Virtually all of mainland China had fallen under communist control. The toll of the war was staggering. Official communist figures reported around 1.5 million dead and wounded among the People's Liberation Army. Approximately 600,000 nationalist troops lost their lives in combat, with triple that number defecting to the communists. The conflict saw the capture of nearly 7 million nationalist troops over four years. Civilian casualties mounted, with approximately 5 million lives lost due to combat, famine, and disease. The pages of history turned, marking the end of a chapter in China's tumultuous journey. The communist victory, regarded as one of the most impressive insurgent successes of the 20th century. The communist triumph in China's civil war can be attributed to a complex interplay of factors that collectively shifted the balance in their favor. One crucial element was the nationalist government's flawed governance, exemplified by rampant hyperinflation that severely impacted both the military and civilian sectors. This economic instability led to corruption, mismanagement, and inadequate support for enlisted soldiers, fostering discontent and widespread desertion. Historians highlight the foundational damage inflicted on the nationalist government during the war with Japan, eroding public trust and portraying it as corrupt and lacking a cohesive vision for China. Chiang Kai-shek's pursuit of a strong centralized government alienated various interest groups, weakening his overall position. In contrast, the communists strategically targeted diverse groups, particularly peasants, securing their support. The communists' success was further propelled by their effective land reform programs, which garnered immense support in rural Aris, coupled with millions of peasants joining or aiding the People's Liberation Army. This created one of the most significant waves of popular support for an insurgency in modern history. The remarkable cohesion within the communist leadership 
reinforced by Mao Zedong's charismatic leadership style and effective communication, stood in stark contrast to the fragmented nature of the nationalist leadership. The Communist Party's manipulation of local politics and successful decentralization of propaganda painted them as defenders of the nation, enhancing their unity of purpose and command. On the international front, the withdrawal of robust American support for the nationalists, influenced by the failure of the Marshall Mission, internal corruption within the KMT, and military setbacks played a pivotal role. The Truman administration's refusal to continue aid, coupled with the US arms embargo, and the consistent support of the Communist Party by the USSR, further tipped the scales in favor of the Communists. The superior training of the Communist Army, backed by the USSR, countered the American assistance received by the Nationalists, marking a decisive turning point in the Chinese Civil War. As the curtain fell on this tumultuous chapter in China's history, the pages of time turned carrying with them the weight of the sacrifices made and the profound shifts in power and ideology. The scars of war etched into the landscape and the collective memory of the nation served as a stark reminder of the enduring impact of conflict. The end of this chapter marked not only the conclusion of a brutal struggle, but also the dawn of a new era one shaped by the indelible imprints left by the trials and tribulations of the past. Here comes the end of our video. What's your take on their journey? What do you think of China's struggle for power? What role do you think China would have played on the global stage if the communists were defeated? We would love to hear your thoughts in the comments below. On that note, we are wrapping up today's video. If you enjoyed today's historical saga, give this video a thumbs up. Don't forget to share this video with your friends and family who would love to know more about China's struggle and civil war.